Welcome to the City Impact Church podcast. Join us weekly to listen to sermons from our Sunday services or our special events. For more information, visit cityimpactchurch.com or find us on our Facebook page. We pray you'll be inspired and challenged by this week's message. Talking about family. You know, my mother taught me a few sayings and... um, You've heard some of them, of course, you know, a stitch in time saves nine and all that kind of stuff. She also said, if you make your bed, you lie in it. Hands up those who've heard that saying, you know. In other words, you know, you do something, you put up with the consequences. And that's why I never made my bed as a young boy. But, um, you know, it's amazing how those sayings kind of take root in your heart and you end up living by them. Uh, good sayings are biblical sayings, uh, even though they may not be scripture, but they're they can be validated by scripture. But there's another saying that uh, I learned, and that is you can't see the forest for the trees. Who's, who's heard of that? You can't see the forest for the trees. In other words, your vision uh, has become blurred. Uh, to be honest, I don't know, a few years back, I like to think it was only two years ago, but it was a little longer, I had to go to the opti- optometrist or whatever it is, you know, the optician, and uh, get my eyes checked because I realized that I wasn't quite uh, reading the small print like I used to read the small print. I did take heart that they said to me that 99.9% of people uh, have vision altering, uh, particularly in their latter life, either long distance or short distance. You know this, of course. And I was devastated that it happened to me because I had 20-20 vision, right? And I grew up in the age where as a kid, if you wore glasses, it wasn't good, right? I'm just saying. Some of you were there. Some of you don't know what I'm talking about. We'll leave it back then. So enough to say I found myself uh, having to, to wear glasses because my vision became distorted. In fact, looking through even the barrel of my gun, uh, looking at these rabbits, you know, sometimes I think, is it a bird or a rabbit? You know, and that's not good, right? So I don't want to shoot the birds. But the thing is, is that sometimes uh, you're naturally blurred and other times we're talking more in the spirit, of course, today. But we end up looking at things with a wrong perspective, a wrong perspective. It may be reality to us because that's our perspective, but it's a wrong perspective. Are you out there today? Sometimes we see things as, they, as we've always seen things, but hands up those who know things are changing. I mean, I wore a jacket last week. I, I boasted I paid 59 US for it. This is the other one I bought. You could tell, right? This had more comments than anything so far in church. So, so the thing was, was that I paid 112 for this one, and I got the other one at half price. And, uh, but last week I said, look at this cool jacket I got on. And many of you, and even watching on, on, on the simulcast and, and live stream, it just looked like a black jacket. But up close, for those who are up close, it had a cool pattern and, and a velvety texture to it, right? But to those that were wondering what I was talking about, it just looked like a black jacket. So it depends on what you're looking at and what you're seeing. Have you all seen those tests by psychologists with cards? You know, I see diamonds, I see circles, I see whatever it is. And there was one on television just recently, and a a guy put up a card with a black square. And 99% of the people said, I see a black square. But one person said, I see white card around a black square. So it depends on what you're looking at. People not only see different things, but also hear different things. I can guarantee you, after I walk out, I will have people say to me things that I never actually said happens every Sunday. And often our perspective, as I said, can be wrong, but it's real to us. And so what happens in life, we often become familiar, even with our families, right? We no longer see them as other people see them, but we become very familiar with them. And that can bring contempt. And we don't really see what is really there. Maybe you just got used to seeing it. Maybe just got used to it. You know, we lived at Gulf Harbor for about 10 years, and some of you will know we had a glorious sea view, one of the best sea views that money could buy. This was the sea view we had. It was pretty much 180 degrees, stunning view. When we first moved, there was wow. Every day was wow, you know. People would come into the home, wow, what a view, and it was. But hands up those who know you get used to it, and even though you may see it, you don't really see it with fresh eyes after a little while because you become used to it. You take it. For granted. Do you know what I'm talking about today? So you can't see the forest for the trees. A couple of photos come up of that of a forest, and you know the saying, and we understand what we're saying, but basically we don't really see or even want to see the reality. And so the saying goes, as my mother said to me, Peter, stop turning a blind eye. 
In other words, I don't want to see it. I don't want to see that bed that's not made. <laughs> right? Stop turning a blind eye. And it's true, you do see what you're looking for. Having got grandchildren, uh, we play various games in the car. Bible quiz is one of my favorite games. I make up the questions and they have to answer and, and so forth, so forth. And then I'll sing some of the songs my, my mother sang to me as a kid. Nursey, come over here and hold my hand. Nursey, there's something I don't understand. In my heart, I've got a funny pain. Oh, 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 it's coming on. And all these songs, I get the kids to sing and they'd sing along. This was a great joke. They've stopped singing them now. When I was in Canada, I tried it. Oh, they came out with a couple, like, any case, about the showman. So we won't talk about it. But the thing is, is that we would play red car. Anybody know the game red car? Spot the red car. Isn't it amazing how many red cars you spot when you're looking for them? All of a sudden, you just they're all over the place, right? Hello, red car. You know, when I was a kid, I used to go white baiting. I love white baiting. I, seriously, I said to Bev, one of my bucket lists, is to go white baiting again. I've been white baiting in the Mokau River and down the rivers in Stratford. This is uh, some white bait that Bev and I bought. We have to buy it these days. Uh, and uh, we had white bait fritters. This is a photo of my dad and my sisters. We're going fishing. But the next photo comes up. We're white baiting. Here's my mother. There's me in my Davy Crockett jacket. With, look at those trousers, Colleen. They match this jacket. See? I told you. She asked me. She was cheeky and said, have I got trousers to match that? Look at those trousers. So in any case, they don't fit me any longer, but they, look at my mum smoking a cigarette. <laughs> Everybody smoked in those days. She taught me how to smoke. And, and, and so that's my sister Barbara there with hair like, like uh, sinead has got. And so white baiting. And you know, when you first go down to the river, you can't see any white bait. But then you spot one. And where there's one, there's more. And all of a sudden you can see white bait because you're looking for white bait. And I want to tell you this is true. When you go home at night, close your eyes. All you can see is white bait. <laughs> Have you ever been mushrooming? I've been mushrooming. I'm a farm boy, right? This is how I grow mushrooms at home. <sighs> Let everything be done decently in order. Who believes that photo is real? <laughs> so the thing is, is that, you know, when you go mushrooming, all of a sudden you see mushrooms. You see one, you see more. And then you go home at night, close your eyes, and all you can see is mushrooms. You know, I got five acres out there in Coastville, and when I moved on it, it had quite a bit of blackberry down the bush covenant area, quite a bit of gorse, and I got rid of all the gorse, and I'm spraying the blackberry. Blackberry keeps coming back. It's a curse to get rid of, right? Amazing how it grows even in the strout. And so I don't know whether you can spot the blackberry in that picture. Most people couldn't. I am very good at spotting blackberry. It's very clearly, it's right in the middle. I put it, made it easy for you, right in the middle of that photo. But a lot of people could walk through and just see the green. But I see the blackberry, right? And so what you're looking for, you'll see. That's my point. Now we know we even go where we're looking. You know, I ride a Harley Davidson. Some of you will know that. And of course, one of the rules of riding a motorcycle is that you look around the corner before you go around the corner. I can recall once going up the Albany Hill, this truck cut, and, and, and cut my wife off. And uh, so I went past him giving him the evil eye. Not the finger, the evil eye. I'm just telling you, even though I had my mask on and nobody could tell who it was. <laughs> and I was looking at him as I was going past because he'd cut my wife off and I was looking at him like this, not realizing where I was going. I was heading into the gutter. <laughs> and so you go where you're looking. It's skateboarding, skiing. I mean, whatever it is in life, you go where you're looking. What are you seeing? What are you looking at? Even in your business, whatever area it is, right? And so horse racing, I grew up on a, on a, in, in, in Stratford on the trotting club because my dad was a president of the trotting club and I wanted to be a jockey, believe me, I wanted to be a jockey, I used to ride horses a lot and I wanted to be a jockey. I was small enough in my younger day to be a jockey but obviously something happened. So the thing was, was when you uh, race some horses, you put blinkers on, they actually call them blinders. Why? Because you don't get any distractions from the horse to run the race. But the trouble is with blinkers, you can miss the full picture. You become very narrow-minded. Some people are so narrow-minded, they can look through a keyhole with both eyes. <laughs> now, we need to be focused, I understand that, so we don't get distracted in life. We've got to keep our eyes on Jesus, right? Be looking ahead. But what do we see? How do we see things? Because for me, and I know for you, it's so important that we end up and hear those words, well done, my good and faithful servant. And so the question today, all that to say this, the question today, listen now, all that to say this, the question is, 
How do we see other people? How do we see other people? You know, it's so easy to see other people as deserved sinners. I tell you, it's getting very confusing out there. I was watching the news last night. I mean, it's nearly every letter in the alphabet describes people today. Nothing simple, did you know that? Not, nothing simple today, right? It's getting very confusing and very messed up out there. No two ways about it. But it's very easy to see people as deserved sinners. It's very easy to forget where we came from. For those having grown up in the church, it's very easy to think, well, they deserve it, I don't. And so often what happens is we put the grace line because we got saved. And I got saved from a misspent youth, you know that. But, you know, it's so easy to move the grace line with us. So we put the grace line right behind us. And this is a measure that people should be up to. But hey, we forget where we come from. So how do we see other people? Maybe we see other people that we don't want to see, that we don't want to relate to. We don't even want to give them the time of day, let alone the gospel. Are you out there? It's going quiet in this place. But whether I'm talking about the waitress, talking about the repairman, talking about the fellow passenger on the plane, talking about your fellow workers, your neighbor, whatever. Self-righteous people, which obviously are found in the church and not necessarily this church, but let me say this today. Self-righteous people, religious people can fall into the trap like the Pharisees. Well, I go to church on Sunday. I pay my tithes. Well, at least I go to church on Sunday. No. Come on, you need to catch up with me. I go to church on Sunday. I'm okay, Jack. I'm okay. And it's so easy. Meanwhile, your neighbor, your colleague, your, your, in your eyes, a, a filthy, dirty, rotten sinner that maybe even deserves hell. Now, you may not say that, but you kind of think, well, that maybe is their own stupid fault. And you might even think they're not interested in the gospel. They, might, they don't want to know. Well, I wanted to know. You wanted to know. Now, I want you to think about the woman of the well. The woman of the well that Jesus came and spoke to she had five husbands, and the one she was living with now wasn't her husband. Who can relate to that? Don't put up your hand. <laughs> Maybe Elizabeth Taylor could relate to it, for those who go back that far. But Jesus, listen now, saw the faults, not the faults of a flesh, but the need of a heart. I said Jesus didn't see the faults of a flesh but the need of a heart. I wonder how we see people. What about the crazy man? The crazy man living in the tombs. He was cutting himself. He wasn't dressed properly. He was screaming. Jesus didn't see the reason why he was there, the mistakes he made, the seed that he sowed to get there. No, Jesus saw a human being that needed to be set free. Jesus saw a slave of that situation and knew that he needed being free. He saw the potential of that man to change a city. Tonight, we're going to see a man who changed the nation. I showed a clip, a memorial of Pastor Reinhard Bonnke. It's staff on Tuesday. Just about every one of them was in tears. They said, would you please play that in church? I said, okay, I'll play it on Sunday night. Now, if you ever want to be inspired and encouraged, then you'll come out tonight. Because his life, I talk so often about people in the past, 1800s, 1500s, 1300s, 300s, that, that were amazing people. This is a living day legend. And so you'll see crowds of 1.8 million people, the largest gathering of human beings on the planet, not recorded in the local paper, not even on the television news. And so I'm playing that tonight. And Jesus saw the potential, obviously, of Reinhard Bonnke. He saw the potential of this madman to go back and change his city. And that's what Jesus told him to do. What about the woman she has bent over for 18 years? And Jesus came along. He didn't say, lady, straighten yourself out. Jesus came along and set her free by the power of the Holy Spirit. He released her from the bondage. So how do we see people? It is true, isn't it? Too often people like to look at others and make opinions. We're very good at making opinions about other people. Very good at judging people, even using Scripture to cast a stone or two, right? It's 
I'm quiet in this place. And yet the word of God tells me that the Bible should be a mirror for us. When we read the word of God, we're not out to condemn sinners and we're not out to say how bad they are. We're out to say how bad we are and how undeserving we are. But by the grace of God. And thank God for his grace and his mercy and his love. But the word is there to encourage us, to inspire us, not to condemn us. And so how do we see people? The Bible says, watch over your heart, for from it flows the issues of life. So I want to inspire you. I want to inspire you to look with the eyes of Jesus. You know the song, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eye. Anybody think I think I can sing, but I know I can't. You know, it's true. I've walked with God days upon days upon days on end, and I'd go away in the bush, and I'd, and I'd, and, and I'd say, God, I, I need a voice. I need to be able to sing. I want to win people to Christ. I need to be a singing evangelist. And I'd start singing. Great. Uh, and I think, boy, that sounds good. God just did a miracle. I believe God for a miracle. And I, it's true. Seriously, time and time again, I'd go home, and I'd say, I even see the bib. You know, God changed my voice, and I'd sing. She said, no. It didn't stop me singing because I just figured it out. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. I mentioned this last week. Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And my thought was last week, if you're not fishing, then maybe you're not following. Now, how do we fish? Well, we can witness like I did to that, mentioned to that guy 35,000 feet in the air. I'm going to go fishing talking to a fellow passenger or talking to an air hostess, we can witness. But not everybody's bold enough. As Krista said, she struggles even to talk to church people. God forbid she's a pastor. Um, <laughs> let alone unsaved people. But, but the thing is, is that you can pray. You can pray for somebody. Somebody walking across the front of you at a stop sign, pray for I saw somebody on television last night that used to come to this church. And I looked at them, and I I was so sad. Some of you may have seen her. And I thought, I'm going to pray for that young girl. I could say, well, she deserved it. She left, and her life went down the spiral train. I'm going to pray for her. We can pray. We can go fishing. We, We can do a good deed. Bake a cake, mow a lawn, do something for somebody, right? Fishing. Or we can give. We can give, right? Fishing. Come on now. And so... Basically, it's coming back to where it all began. You know, there's a graphic comes up on the screen. Some of you were here, some of you weren't, but look at that. I had a stick man before, pa- before Pack and Save had a stick man. <laughs> I am just telling you, I was a trendsetter, and I had the stick man, he had a net, a- and uh, cast into the sea, catching fish. That was, that's our very first service down in Browns Bay. We had to block it out up the top there because uh, the topics Pastor Rob Wheeler was preaching was witchcraft, and, and, um, and um, cults, something like exorcism, yeah. Fourth of July, 1982, exorcism. So in any case, I thought I'd freak you out if I put the topics up there, so we blocked them out for you. So here I had this man with a net. This is where it began, church. And then the next graphic, I, we, we modernized it a bit because somebody said stick people aren't in, so I had to put a proper guy up there and, and casting the net and so forth, so forth. But this is what we're about. This is what we're about. Now, I like fishing. I'm not a mad king fisherman like Josh Adams and Mark Taylor and a few others in the church, but I like fishing. There's a photo of me as a little boy catching some fish. Look at that. Look at that. Miles Oxford and all. Look at those tiddlers. Here's me catching a Beautiful colored fish, a bit bigger. And then the next fish I caught, look at that, me and my grandson Jaden. Marlon, hands up those who know you get bigger in life. I said, hands up those who know your catch gets a little bit bigger in life. Come on now. We should be progressing. We should go from strength to strength. Amen. And so listen now, listen now, listen now, listen now. Do we want to fish or do we want to become a, just a cruise ship? Think about it. Have we become comfortable, so relaxed that we're drifting off to sleep? Because that's what happens on a cruise ship, taking your ease in Zion, right? And maybe you don't realize that the church was never meant to be a cruise ship. 
It's meant to be a working ship, a working crew, a fishing vessel, saving other people from the sea of life, right? And so Graham Bird is in the church. He's a captain of a cargo ship. He knows that everybody on that ship, everybody has got a part to play. There's no passengers. And if we don't see that, then what happens is we just drift and we change vessels and become the Titanic. But it's all about luxury, it's all about comfort, it's all about our needs, it's all about our wants, it's about scratching my itch, it's about what's in it for me. Because that's why you go on the cruise, to eat all you can eat. Hands up those who know, when you eat all you can eat, and you go lazy on a deck chair, you become very lethargic in life. Right? That's why it's good to be lean and mean in life. But the thing is, is that you know, we question when we get a little lethargic, when we get a little lazy, is the church fulfilling my needs? We may not even say it out loud, but the focus and the mission gets drifting off and what was intended, that is an outward focus, becomes a very inward focus. Where it's all about me, we forget. When we got saved, the change that happened in our life, we forget the difference it makes in other people's lives and so we chop and change. And the grass always looks green on the other side of the fence where my need can be met. And so we just shuffle the deck chairs around on these cruise vessels without accomplishing much for the kingdom. And so we look to what pleases us and what meets our need. What scratches my itch? You know, people go through seasons, dry seasons. I've led a marriage, you work through every season of your life. Stay committed. But I'll tell you why people get dry. Because they're no longer fishing. They're in the cabin. Have you seen on television that, that cruise ship where people are locked up in their cabins? <laughs> it's not pleasant. But you know, I know, it can be comfortable in a cabin for a while, but when you leave the deck, when you leave the deck, I know people say, oh, I'll just have a break for, 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 for six months. And they have a break, and then next thing, they're broken. They just drift off. They didn't mean to happen. But when you leave the deck, listen now, a fishing boat can be a messy boat. There's blood on the deck. I know people today don't like talking about killing rabbits, killing fish. You get into trouble. You'll be in trouble soon fishing. But the thing is, is that there's blood on the deck. It's not always pleasant. <laughs> a fishing boat is not always pleasant. I used to work on the cranes down the harbor board, you know, and, uh, you know, I've been around a lot of fishing, uh, fishing boats and a lot of cargo boats. They're not sparkling clean. They're not like the cruise ships. No cruise ship used to come into New Plymouth. But they're not always sparkling clean. But listen now, it is doing what it's supposed to do. Thank you, Pastor Kim. Proverbs say, if you want a clean stable, have no cattle in the store. But guess what? The stable was built for the cattle. And where the cattle is, there's mess. But it's being used for what it was built for. It comes up on the screen, a cow shed that my dad built. My dad built the cow. You can't, I should have got a photo of the cow shed. I got a photo of it. Uh, sorry, I'm still talking about the cow shed, guys. Um, I should have... I should have got the photo. I, I just visited that place the other day over Christmas, and uh, we used to milk the cows by hand. We didn't have many in those days, about 40, and then we got a bigger herd, so we had to get machines in. And uh, look at those messy tails. You know, when a cow wheezes, it sprays. If you're standing in a proximity, you get wet. Cows normally have the runs. And when they flick the tail, when you're sitting there and that tail comes around, look what's on, the, on that tail. And it's in your face. Who doesn't know what I'm talking about? Some of you need to get out more, I know, but it's a messy place, the cow shed. My job was to get the high-pressure hose and Hose down all the muck and the urine. I used to love the smell. <laughs> Who likes the smell of insulage? I ride the bike, I go through, and I'm going, mm, and Bev goes, oh, yuck. 
She's a city girl. God, God help her. And so that cow shit is doing what it was supposed to do. And the next photo of the horse, I used to do a lot of horse riding, as you know. And, and uh, you know, horses, they make a mess in the stall, in the stable, right? And so the church, what it was built for, I mentioned it time and time again. Number one, the church is here to glorify God, right? Not to race in and race out, but to spend a moment glorifying His name. Number two, we're here to mature the saints, to gut the fish and to clean them, right? To help people grow to Christ-likeness. And we're also here, of course, for the saving of souls. Those three things and those three things alone. Now, I know we can do a lot of other things, but if we leave that mission, church, and become comfortable in it, and have people on the boat but not working in the crew, we run a danger. And so the church is a fishing boat. Can I just mention, in case you've forgotten, in case you don't know, Jesus did say to his disciples, look, look, there's plenty of fish in the sea. He put it this way, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. He said, lift up your eyes and look, the field is wide under harvest. Look at all the mushrooms. How do we see the fields? How do we see the harvest? How do we see people? Or do we even see them? When we go to the mall, what do you see? I look at all these people, I think, why aren't they in my church? That's what I see. How can I reach all these people? That's what I see. And so we can be Christians for so long that we become familiar and complacent with our vision. Or we can grow up in the house of the Lord and not even understand or, or care. We don't understand how people can live such lives. But I find a very interesting scripture, Exodus 2 verse 10, talking about Moses. After Moses was weaned, she presented him as a mother to Pharaoh's daughter, who adopted him as a son. She named him Moses, saying, I pulled him out of the water. Time passed. Moses grew up, 40 years of age. One day, one day, everybody say one day. One day he went and saw his brothers and saw all the hard labor. Now listen, Moses was 40 years of age. He'd been around slaves all his life. All his life. He had seen the whip. He had seen people dying on the slave train. He had seen the hardships of the Israelites. He had heard their groans. He saw the rags they wore. He smelled the onions and the leeks that they ate. He saw the beatings as they built the pyramids and whatever. He had lived a lot among it so long he had been part of it. But one day, he saw it different. One day, he heard it different. One day, it happened in a day. He had been like that for 40 years. But all of a sudden, he got 20-20 vision. All of a sudden, he saw things from God's perspective. He saw things because the people of Israel were crying out to the Lord. And all of a sudden, he heard things from God's perspective. And it says in Hebrews 11, By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child. They were not afraid of the king's command. By faith, Moses, when he became age 40, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. And so, friend, we can become so comfortable that we forget what it's like to be a slave of sin. Now, we know Moses' Old Testament, first in the natural, then in the spiritual. Jesus comes along and says, you are slaves of sin. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed, right? We know about natural slavery, but there's also spiritual slavery. People get caught with cords of sin, pornography and lust and all those kind of things, right? Lying and stealing and, and, and uh, uh, alcohol and drugs. People become caught and, and trapped and ensnared and slaves, right? Bev and I watched a movie in the States just recently is called Harriet, named after Harriet Tolman. Some of you would have known her or of her. And she was a woman that lived in the 18th century, in the days of slavery in America, right? And she was a, a black slave and uh, born in slavery. And the story goes this. She wanted to become free. She wanted to have freedom like anybody. And so without going into all the story and taking away from the amazing movie, I'd love you to watch it, because she was a, a woman who heard from God. She'd fall into a trance, and God would tell her this, or God would tell her that, and, 
and don't go this way and go that way. Amazing story. And so when she ran, she ran 100 miles. That's a long way on foot. To Pennsylvania, where if she made and crossed the border, she would be free. And so she made that journey by herself, which was a miracle. She lived one year in Pennsylvania as a free woman. And then she said these words. She said, I cannot live free while my family are in slavery. They said to her, if you go back there, you'll be killed, you'll be hung, you'll be tortured. She said, I'm going back. She made the journey back to get a husband who actually had, had remarried and that broke her heart and she got her brothers and sisters and so forth and brought them to freedom. She made several journeys back. The slave owners called her Moses, not realizing it was a woman. Moses, God said, set my people free. And so the states passed a, a law that no matter where the slaves ran to in America, they could still be the property of the landowner, and the landowner could go and get them and bring them back into slavery. So these slaves had to move to Canada. It was no longer 100 miles, but now six, 700 miles. Snow, hardship. And so the story goes, and I'm going to play a clip out of this movie, where she is in Canada with these other people who are interested in freeing slaves. And they are saying it's too hard and too tough. And I want you to listen very closely at the words that she says, because of exactly what I'm talking about today. Let's play that clip. Thank you. All right. This is uh, Senator William Seward. Ms. Tubman, it's an honor to welcome you to my home. My condolences. How can I help? Five hundred miles. Five hundred miles from the Mason Dixon Line, Canada. An unimaginable distance. Slave catchers are monitoring all northbound travel. God help the man without free papers. How are we going to get our passengers from the southern farms and plantations all the way to the border of Canada? We can't keep trying to outrun them. We have to fight. The only way to make the fugitive slave law a dead letter is to make half a dozen or more dead slave catchers. That will cool their ardor. You may be right. Civil war might be our only hope. We can't just give up and wait for war. We need to get back to work bringing slaves to freedom. By train or carriage, horseback, on foot if necessary. Harriet, the journey from Maryland to Canada is 600 miles from the Canadian border. Your longest trip was 100. Now that would take months, not weeks. You can't. I ain't giving up rescuing slaves because it's far. Many of you don't know slavery firsthand. You were born free. You've been free so long you forget what it's like. Gotten comfortable and important. Got beautiful homes, beautiful wives. But I remember. Jim beat for not working for they understand what work is. Try not to think of what they went through. Those still enslaved are going through right now. But I've heard their groans and their sighs. I've seen their tears, and I would give every last drop of blood in my veins to free them. So I ain't giving up. I'm gonna do what I gotta do. Go wherever I gotta go. However, I got to do it to free as many slaves as possible to this beast, this monster called slavery is slain dead.
A couple of photos come up on the screen. Just put up those photos if we can. Seven hundred and fifty freed, freed under her ministry. Amazing. Died at a ninety-one years of age, and look at the last words that she said. I go to prepare a place for you. Wow! When I heard that speech, I was, can, this is a true story. I was so touched and so moved, convicted and challenged, yes, stirred. And, uh, you know, when she says, we've got to get back to what do what we do. And we'll do whatever it takes. Sometimes people say it's too hard. Nobody wants to know and all that kind of stuff. But, hey, we're here to fish for people. The Sunday gathering is not what it's about in the sense of Monday to Friday. That's where the harvest is. But we come together to be encouraged, to worship. We come together to, to, to meet one another, fellowship. But you know, when we're out there, Monday to Friday, just shaking hands with someone, I'd love you to reach out with the love of Christ in some way. As I said, whether it's a prayer, whether it's a word, whether it's a deed, but fish because lost people matter to God. And this awesome speech that she said, I just want to close with a couple of thoughts. It's true that life is short, eternity is long. And like what Russell Crowe said, what we do in this life echoes in eternity. So can I just encourage you to be a person of humility? Pride is one of the subtle enemies of a powerful evil. And I want everyone here to be aware and guard against any sense of superiority, any sense of self-importance or thinking that we're better than those others that, that are dirty, rotten sinners. Seeing yourself better, like remembering Jesus was a friend of sinners and tax gatherers and by the grace of God, I'm one of those people. I'm able to talk to, whether it be a solicitor or, 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 or a truck driver, I don't care who it is. I'll, I'll just talk to them. I, I've been blessed like that. I know some people struggle with different people to relate to, but I want to encourage you to allow God to touch your life and overcome the fear of man. I said overcome the fear of man. Use every opportunity to serve others, to share your faith, tell your story. That, you know that guy that got saved out of the tomb? He only knew Jesus for a day. A day. Hadn't been to Bible school, hadn't been in church. She said, you go back and tell the city what God's done for you. Wow. Pray for someone, practice a good deed. You know, in closing, it's true. You know, we come to things like global, come to things like that, open heaven, it was awesome time, right? And uh, we can get all pumped up. But like a tire that loses air slowly, if it's unnoticed leak, we become flat. I said we become flat and we can't go too far. So my exhortation to you this morning, as I know City Impact Church isn't a church for everybody because it's a church where you get challenged. It's a church where you'll get uh, convicted, I hope. Why would you want to come here and leave the same way you walked in? It's a church that believes that we all should be involved in the work of the kingdom, not just the preacher and not just the, the select few, but every one of us has got a part to play, right? We are a fishing boat. We are a working crew. We're not a passenger ship. If somebody just wants to take the reasons on, I know City Impact Church isn't the place for that. I know that. And I, I thank God for the lives, the thousands of lives we've reached and touched and brought people from A to K or from A to B or from A to Q, wherever it is, and been a part of that. I understand that. But I'm looking for people who will roll up their sleeves and help catch some fish and believe God for sinners to be saved like, a, uh, like me once. If somebody hadn't reached out to me and if somebody hadn't reached out to you, and so we all need it. I'm going to get the musicians to come. We're closing the service. But I want to close with that song. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe, the Holy Spirit. Maybe as you're standing there, you just want to rededicate your life. Just say, God, use me. Be like the prophet of old. Here I am, Lord, send me. And just say, God, give me opportunities. Give me openings. Give me doors that I can walk through. You know, we're going to close in a moment. But friend, let's just... Sing this before we go on our way. Can we do that? Father, I just thank you so much for every person here.